Our fourth speaker is Mary Evelyn Tucker, who is co-director of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University. She teaches in an MA program between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the Divinity School at Yale. With John Grimm, she has organized 10 conferences on world religions and ecology at Harvard. They've been series editors for many volumes, focusing on things, for example, Confucianism and ecology, Buddhism and ecology, Hinduism and ecology, and so on. She's also authored Ecology and Religion, and she has co-written Journey of the Universe, Yale University Press 2011, executive producer of the Emmy Award-winning Journey film that aired on PBS. She served on the International Earth Charter Drafting Committee and was a member of the Earth Charter International Council. Dr. Tucker's presentation today is titled The Ecological Spirituality of Pierre Teilhard de Chardon. Would you join me in welcoming her? Different title, <laughs> but the same spirit, because Teilhard is such a great Jesuit that still lives today. I want to begin, as many have, by deep thanks to Peter Raven, to Pat Raven as well, heroes of mine, to Trudy Valentine and her wonderful partner John, to Jack Fishman, to Angela Carr, to David Webb, to Matt Hulskamp and this extraordinary IT tech team, to all those who've provided food and hotel and transportation for us, delicious food, um, the Nine Network and Jack Galmish. Can we give up a hand of applause for all of them? I want to begin also by drawing on the wonderful conversation that was given to us yesterday afternoon by Peter Raven and Jack McCarthy, which brings together some of the points that I'm going to draw on today of Journey of the Universe, this evolutionary story and wonder and awe that Heather just spoke about so beautifully. Um, you know, because the invitation into a big picture, into deep time, helps us in many ways. It helps us with the despair that surrounds us with the agony of an unknown future, with the sorrow of the loss of species. So this invitation, I would suggest, is to the embodiment, embeddedness, if you will, of universe or cosmos, of earth and of humans. That's a Chinese cosmological worldview too. So we're embedded in a universe, an earth, and humans. And how does that matter? It's an invitation into deep time, into deep time, which matters enormously. A 14 billion year old universe that our grandparents had no idea how old it was. So I'm going to touch on that, but I just wanted to set the context here. And by curious um, synchronicity, someone put in the biography something about my grandfather, which is the first time that's ever appeared. But it relates in this way. My grandfather, Carlton Hayes, um, happened to be one of the first Catholic professors at Columbia, actually, and he was a European historian. And he was trying to get the Columbia History Department to move beyond American history to European history because he said, we've got to understand where we come from. He was also very concerned about the, the wars, the two world wars. And his last book, in fact, was Nationalism, a Religion. He was trying to get us to think of the power of nationalism. His student, Ted DeBerry, um, fought in the Second World War and came back to Columbia to found one of the most extraordinary Asian studies programs, I would say, in the world, actually. And I was his student um, in the study of Asian religions, especially in China and Japan. Now, when I came out of Columbia, there was a movement called, big, uh, called World History, which I taught in for several years. What I'm trying to illustrate here, this is in one lifetime, right? American history, European history, Asian history, world history. And now what we have, especially on the secondary school level, is big history, right? Big history. Um, and the invitation into the universe story to say we're part of 
cosmos, earth, and human, is a major watershed for human consciousness of our profound interdependence and human conscience of the changes we need to make that have been so well described by Peter Glick and Jane Lubchenco and so many others. We have extraordinary people working on these problems. So this is, let's see, the round one, just the round one. Okay, so thank you. So cultural attitudes, as you know, are shaped by a variety of things, um, worldviews and spirituality, but they're derived from world religions, from humanitarian and secular values. We can't leave this out because that has been a huge, huge impetus for the environmental movement uh, for more than 40 years. Environmental ethics, especially coming from intrinsic value, of utilitarian value and so on, from philosophy. Biophilia that Ed Wilson and my colleague at Yale put forward. The love of nature, which has been brought up over and over again. Um, and also aesthetics and the arts. All of these are sources we need to draw on clearly. Now, everybody likes to know where one comes from. So here's my story. If I can get it to move forward. Um, in 73, 74, I went to Japan after Nixon was elected, by the way, and I said, I'm going until he's out of office, <laughs> um, which I did. And I was very much caught up in the different religions of Japan, of Shinto here, uh, down in Hiroshima. Why are this? Okay, sorry. Um, of Zen Buddhism and these extraordinary gardens uh, in Kyoto. Um, this is a Confucian daimyo castle. And ultimately, I became extremely interested in Confucianism because it's a system that has not only a spiritual and cosmological worldview, but an educational philosophy, a political philosophy, and a philosophy of moral cultivation, one of the most comprehensive traditions on the planet. Um, but here was Japan when I went. And this is what happened over time, uh, Mount Fuji and, and the pollution and so on. Um, I went to China in 85 and have been there many, many times. And as you know, the rivers, the soil um, are deeply, deeply polluted. Now, I said to myself, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an economist, a policy person. What can we contribute to these issues? Because even now, China, from the time I first went, to now. This is unbelievable. A program called Under the Dome was shown uh, in China. 30 million people watched it. 30 million people. And then it was taken off. The Chinese know what their issues are, what their problems are, and we can discuss that further. But what we're trying to bring forward with hundreds and hundreds of scholars and practitioners is this sense of appreciating difference and unity. So we know religion, culture, and ethics are needed for the solutions. We did, as uh, Tobias just said, these Harvard conferences and then created um, a forum on religion and ecology. But we also need a story that brings us together based on the best of modern science, drawing together all of the various sciences. Now, Thomas Berry, how many of you know Thomas Berry's work? Excellent. <laughs> you pass. Um, so Thomas Berry was a great inspiration to my husband and I, to Heather, to many, many people. A thousand people came to his funeral in 2009 in New York. Um, and he continues to inspire through these uh, various books. Dream of the Earth, uh, I mentioned yesterday, great work. The Sacred Universe, these were his last two books. Uh, the Christian Future in the Face of uh, fate of Earth. He was a Catholic priest. He comes out of a Catholic tradition, but also studied the world's religions. He also was an inspiration for the whole idea of journey of the universe. He was truly a Renaissance man. Um, he said, the universe itself is the primary sacred community. This is where revelation begins. And he invited us back into that powerful, unmediated, sense of where we live and how powerful these ecosystems are um, to us, with us. He also said the universe is a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. The subjectivity that is threaded throughout these systems, the 
various animal, bird, fish intelligences, the migrations of salmon, of turtles, of caribou, and so on, we are beginning to realize we are part of a living earth community. How thrilling is that? Um, he also said no previous human community has faced such a comprehensive crisis threatening ecosystems and species on a global, global scale. He was saying this at the same time Peter Raven was saying, and he often pointed us in the direction of Peter um, as one of the very first to alert us to these problems. Um, he said, we have ethics for homicide and suicide and genocide, but not for biocide and geocide. This is the level on which we need to think, regenerate, work with scientists, uh, policy people, economists, and so on. So this dialogue that's been spoken about throughout the conference um, is emerging, and that is very exciting. Some of the dialogue partners, in addition to Peter, or Jane Lubchenco, who's right here, Ursula Goodenough, who was at Washington University, Tom Lovejoy uh, on our board at Yale too, Ed Wilson and Peter Crane, our former dean. All of these have opened the doors to say, just as this conference is saying, we need the voices of the world's religions. In policy, Gus Speth, after 40 years of working in the environment, head of UNDP, founded NRDC, worked with the Carter administration, said we can't do this without religion and spirituality. That's why he brought us to Yale. The law people, the uh, ecological economics people, all are partners um, with us. Now, what's our common ground of religion and science? Again, Heather said it eloquently. Uh, John McCarthy said it yesterday. Wonder, awe, beauty. This is easy to bring forward. It's a DNA, I would say, the awe DNA that we all share from children to old age. So that which brings us together, the shared wonder that we are on a volcanic planet. That's partly what has created the sources of ecosystems and life. This is a fiery, moving, dynamic, uh, geologically plate tectonic uh, system incredible geological systems and e ecosystems. We, this picture, as we know, transformed all of us, I think, sitting in this room. Uh, we can remember when we first saw moon rise, earth rise, uh, and so on from space, bringing us into the sense of the fragility, of the specialness, this blue-green planet. We know life will continue, but what is our responsibility in this con continuity of evolution. We're at a cultural evolution right now, and that's where we can participate and make a difference. Um, again, the conditions for even our solar system, as we know, were just right, our distance from the, the sun, uh, and so on. This sense that we are part of one <laughs> of trillions of galaxies now, uh, is something that I think can awaken almost more than anything else, a sense of awe and deep time, why these systems matter, why we're a water planet, uh, as Peter and Jane say so eloquently, why life has emerged here. We don't have a full answer to these questions, but a 14 billion year evolutionary process, 10 billion years even before our planet uh, emerge. We're a 4.6 billion year creation, shall we say. First cell, a billion years. Second, multicellular life, two, altogether two billion years. And Ursula Goodenough from Washington University says in our journey conversations, the cell has a sense of self. Motility, <laughs> discernment, and so on. It's an amazing uh, interview. So this is why we did Journey of the Universe um, that, as you know, went on PBS and so on. We're just going to play a minute and a half of the trailer uh, right now so you can get a feel for what this film was trying to do. You know, Pythagoras probably walked on this very beach. And if he were here today, he would be amazed at how much mathematical science has learned about the universe. 
Even a century ago, we didn't know if there were two galaxies in the entire universe. Now we know there are a hundred billion, maybe even a trillion galaxies. What is the creativity that brought forth a trillion galaxies? couple centuries, we have learned more about the Earth than in perhaps the previous 100,000 years. How are we going to convey that, the essence of that, to the next generation? The universe began as a great outpouring of cosmic breath, cosmic energy, that then swirled and twisted and complexified until it could burst forth into flowers and animals and fish and all of these elegant explosions of energy. These deep discoveries of science are leading to a new story of the universe. Over the course of 14 billion years, Hydrogen gas transformed itself into mountains, butterflies, the music of Bach, and you and me. So we should almost stop there <laughs> with creation care. Um, but we want to go forward to say that's deep time. And now the, dif the invitation is to the differentiated cultural expression of how we live in these Earth systems. And part of this is to acknowledge from the very beginning there's problems with religions and there's promise. There's possibilities and there's difficulties. We could spend the rest of the time talking about that. But we have... Um, with many, many people, there's an emergence over the last 25 years of statements from religious leaders, of academics who are reevaluating these traditions, literally hundreds of scholars. There were seven jobs in this area last year. Um, the grassroots eco-justice networks are absolutely flourishing. So, as we know, the religious leaders, uh, the Pope, the Dalai Lama, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, I'll come back to him, this is Rowan Williams, who was head of the uh, Anglican Church, um, and there are others, Thich Nhat Hanh, you must know, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey was the past bishop of the Episcopal Church, evangelical leaders, we have some with us, but Joel Hunter, um, and the wonderful nun in Taiwan, Su Ji, doing absolutely remarkable work. Um, environmental justice in the last number of years has really come forward. And if you know Wangari Mathai, who was very much inspired by Thomas Berry, um, she founded the Greed Belt Movement. She's just one example of the empowerment of women for planting trees and so on. But this is why the Pope's encyclical is so important, bringing so much of this together. Statements, grassroots movements, academics. Um, what we did, it seems like a hundred years ago, but we just celebrated the 20th anniversary last year, um, over a three-year period at Harvard Center for the Study of World Religions, we did this effort at retrieving, reevaluating, and reconstructing with all the world's religions, with specialties in the Asian religions, the Western religions, and indigenous um, religions. Very exciting, extremely difficult to do, especially at Harvard. There was no field, there was no force in the, the world. I hugged a lot of trees <laughs> to just have the uh, the sensibility of where we can do this, even in academia. So we culminated this with Bill Moyers interviewing religious leaders. We announced the forum at the United Nations. This is one of the great leaders of Confucianism, um, Du Wei Ming. 
and we created this uh, forum on religion and ecology, first at Harvard and then at Yale, uh, because faculty wanted us to come there. Now, this book series, and I'm happy to give you a copy, if you like, of the Christianity one, is the thickest. We had 200 people at that conference. It was extraordinary. Um, the, uh, all of the Western religions over here, Asian religions, and indigenous traditions was massive. Every continent was represented. Absolutely extraordinary. And their struggles are not to be believed, as we know, including... Uh, people being shot for what they're doing. So I want to just give you a sense of some of the values that came up after this, or with this three-year conference series. Reverence for the earth community. You know, this is probably one of the most profound human emotions. Again, Heather referred to it, John McCarthy did. A deep reverence for these amazing life systems and their profound complexity. Um, respect for myriad species. This is shared among the world's religions. And by recovering both passages and texts and traditions that we can now bring forward, you see, um, to bear on the biodiversity loss that uh, Peter Raven has highlighted, um, restraint in the use of natural resources, a redistribution of technology and aid, responsibility for the future of life, all life, and restoration of ecosystems and the human spirit. I'm going to just um, conclude with bringing back into the conversation the Greek Orthodox Patriarch Bartholomew, all of these conferences. We went on about five of them. Uh, Jane Lipchenko was a key science advisor to um, Bartholomew, but I want to highlight on the Amazon, we're out there in the Amazon on boats, Bartholomew apologized for forced conversion and manipulation of culture of indigenous peoples. The Pope has followed that same uh, procedure in Bolivia and Colombia. Absolutely extraordinary. Now, I'm going to end with the encyclical, because that's why we're here. This is one of the most important documents of our lifetime. Bill McKibben says, without doubt, it's the most important document of the 21st century, which I find astounding. Um, the content brings us to this worldview shift of this integral ecology of people and the planet, um, of eco-justice and sustainability, of a spiritual ecology, this kinship and connection, a call to ecological conversion, as no other document has done on such a comprehensive level. So the potential for outreach, for sustainability and spirituality, of course it's a letter, um, there's two billion Christians, but the, every religious community has responded to that. It's on our website, the forum website, and it's addressed to all peoples around the planet. You've heard about what the Jesuits are doing, the largest educational system in the world from Nancy um, earlier. Um, and here I conclude with this notion of how sustainability and spirituality can come together. We have these cultural values and ethics uh, from the world's religions. We have educational establishments like the Jesuits. We've got leadership and grassroots outreach that we did not have 20 years ago. We have resilience and inspiration and we have the basis of one telling of the story of the universe. There will be other st stories for sure, but let me end on this note. We are in this extraordinary energy revolution from unsustainable fuels to sustainable fuels. I think, and I think you would all agree, and this conference represents that, that the greatest sustainable and renewable energy is that of the human spirit and that is in greater abundance than we have yet tapped into. It will get us through. Thank you very much. <laughs>